Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Saving Our Great Barrier Reef. This is the second in our national UNAA Young Professionals series on sustainability in action. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, formally acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're running this event from, which tonight is in Brisbane or Mianjin, the Turbal and Yagara people. And on behalf of the entire UNAA, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and particularly acknowledge that for at least 60,000 years, Australia's first peoples have been the custodians and the scientists and the caretakers of all of our ecosystems on land and in the sea, particularly the Great Barrier Reef. So we have much to learn as people going forward, and we hope to start there tonight. My name is Joel Lindsay. I am the Queensland Committee President of the UNA Young Professionals. Um, and welcome. Formally welcome to all of our panelists and our attendees to this awesome event on the Great Barrier Reef. We're glad that you are joining us to talk about an important issue for Australia as a country and also Queensland in particular. As I mentioned, this is the second event in our national event series. The first, if you have managed to make it a few weeks ago, was uh, Professor Veena Sahajwala from UNSW, who really opened up the whole series and talked about the importance of recycling and really highlighted some awesome uh, innovations that she has personally been a part of for moving away from waste as a byproduct and really looking at the future of recycling and waste and you know sustainability as a really core cool business concept. So we're very excited now to pivot to Queensland's event this evening on the Great Barrier Reef. What we'll be doing this evening is uh, highlighting four phenomenal speakers who are experts in their field across the Queen across the state. We're going to be doing a uh, roughly 10 minutes per speaker, introducing themselves, the work they're doing, and really how you can get involved with that work. And then Olivia, one of our UNYP committee members, will facilitate a Q&A with the panelists. And that's really your chance to get engaged. And we want you to be active in the chat, active in the Q&A, especially because we want to answer your questions and really, you know, make this a valuable evening for everyone involved. So before we start, as I said, I'm on the traditional lands of Turbal and Yagara people. And if you're comfortable or you know where you're joining the, uh, the chat from, please chuck in the chat the city you're joining from and the traditional owners if you know the names. It's a great way to just see who's here, see where we're coming from, and you need to learn some more about uh, First Nation history of our great country. So. I'd like to introduce Olivia Jurat. She's one of our excellent committee members here in Queensland and also an avid surfer, therefore quite passionate about the health of the ocean and the reef and all the things that go along with it. So Olivia is gonna be our MC for this evening. So I'm going to introduce her now, throw over to Olivia and she's gonna introduce our fantastic speakers. Thank you very much and Olivia, take it away. Hi everyone, thanks Joel. Um, yeah, so we're gonna hear from four amazing speakers tonight. We've got Professor Peter Mumby, uh, Gavel, Gavin Singleton, Jen McCorder and Halton King. I'll do like a very brief introduction um, and then just hand over to the first speaker to sort of give uh, an introduction of them and their work um, and they'll get to talk about um, sort of some solutions and exciting projects in the area of reef protection as well. So um, first of all, I'll start off with Peter, um, has had a very, very colourful career. Um, at the moment is based in Queensland and uh, studying working on changes in human activity and how that affects the health of our reef. Um, I will let Peter take it away and talk more about that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Olivia. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, so just hoping you could um, just give a, yeah, you know, five, ten minute introduction of your work um, and some of the issues you've seen there and um, some sort of solutions you would be like to look for in the in the future. So just, yeah, introduction of it. You can talk about previous work you have done. Yeah, sure. No, I thought I was going to see my face on the screen, but I didn't. So I was oh, a bit, sorry. I thought we were in the, the switch over. Um, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the uh, <coughs> Turrbal and Yugara uh, lands this evening. Um, so, you know, I have the privilege to work on coral reefs. And I, I thought I'd just start by, you know, making an obvious point that I think most people are aware that um, climate change is the number one threat facing our reefs. And I'm not going to say much more about that because I know that one of our other speakers, Jennifer, will talk about that in a lot more detail. Um, but there's often a bit of a misunderstanding about the role of local reef protection. Um, there has been a sense of 
futility sometimes amongst people managing reefs because they might perceive that the climate change problems are so overwhelming. What is the point of local action? And certainly the work that I've done in, in, in my career, I think is quite unequivocal that local management is hugely important in helping us chart a safe future for coral reefs. And I guess I'll start with a bit of a story of mine. And my career began as a as an undergraduate, I went out on a conservation project in Belize in the Caribbean. And I was actually working with citizen science at the time. We were surveying reefs and drawing up plans for how to manage protected areas and so on. And there used to be this reef at the end of the island that I would take people to teach them identification of corals. And it was fabulous because I knew every single coral uh, on every single patch of reef. You know, I could find whatever I needed. Um, and that was, uh, you know, just, just, just great. And then five years later, maybe a bit longer, there was the first major global coral bleaching event. Um, there's also a hurricane that occurred. And when I came back to that reef afterwards, it was incredibly damaged. I'd never seen a reef damaged like that before. And, and because I knew it so well, like you'd know your own garden, it, it was pretty jarring for me to see that. And I've been monitoring those reefs for about 20 years. And so that event happened in 1998. Um, by 2004, um, things had really changed in Belize. When I started working there, it was a pretty affluent sort of fishery. People were fishing mostly lobsters, conch, grouper, grouper, and the sort of fish like parrotfish, which eat algae, uh, or at least impact algae, um, weren't really being targeted. And, um, and, and no one really thought they would be. But over a few years that the group of populations had been depleted, the snappers, which of course are very desirable, have been depleted. And, and by 2004, parrotfish had become the number one fish species to target. Um, and what that does is, is essentially allow seaweeds to grow almost unconstrained. And by 2009, the reefs were looking absolutely awful. Uh, and that was really a sort of low point. Um, the good news was that about that time, after a considerable amount of, of effort, um, the government introduced, at the request of fishermen, a ban on, on fishing parrotfish. And I then have some surveys from 10 years after that. And it was remarkable to see the recovery, that the reefs, the, the parrotfish recovered. Um, the reefs became much more resilient again. I mean, they don't look the most beautiful I've ever seen them, but they look a lot better than I'd ever seen them um, for many, many years. And so that was a positive story that made you think, yeah, this sort of local action really does make a difference between a reef that is not showing any kind of recovery and one that's looking great. So another story um, would be from Palau, going into the Pacific now in Micronesia. And Palau is this sort of beautiful place. If you haven't heard of it, have a little look on Google. It's a gorgeous looking um, place. But in the so early 2000s, there was a fair amount of development extending a road up one of the main islands. And every time that it would rain, a lot of soil would get washed off through the rivers. And a study at the time was looking at the amount of sediment um, falling out onto the reef. And it was, it was pretty severe. Over the last few years, we've done some experiments out there. Um, and what we do is we go right in close to land where they've got all the mangroves and we sort of put out and look at what's happening to the reefs there. And then we go just a few miles offshore and we do this transect as you get to cleaner and cleaner water until you get to these beautiful reefs a bit further out. And we look at how well corals can recover along that gradient. Um, and it's a bit dicey doing that kind of work because you get right into the mangroves, you know that there are crocodiles there. Um, so it's not ideal, but... Um, it just adds a bit of extra excitement to the field work. But what we're seeing is that as you get to those areas with really high sediment, you see a vastly diminished ability for corals to recover. And so it's very clear that um, the sediment is a problem. And one of the great things is that when we compare the amount of sediment today, now that those areas that were being uh, cleared for roads have now been completely recovered with plants, um, the sediment coming into the system is much less than it was um, 15 years ago. And again, this is another story of success. The, the corals, although if you go right up into the mangroves, they don't do very well, 
most of those reefs have got pretty good recovery. So again, local action on making sure that the, that the land is quite well protected really makes a difference. Um, and then finally, if I can just bring it back to the Great Barrier Reef, you know, one of the things that's really noticeable and not surprising given that, that this reef is, you know, the size of Japan or Italy or Germany, take your pick, it's varied. Not all reefs are the same. Some of them are much more important than others. Some of those reefs are in positions where they act as, as hubs. Um, and you can sort of liken it like, you look about all of the airports around Australia, and if you had to pick which airport was probably the most valuable, you'd probably pick um, Sydney because it has the most international connections. And you, know, you can do a similar thing on reefs, which reefs are more valuable in as much as if they're healthy, when those corals reproduce, as they do every November, December, and they release these bundles of eggs and sperm, those fertilized eggs are going to travel to other reefs downstream and start the generation of new corals. And, and we can sort of map where they're going and how connected the system is. And one of the opportunities today for engagement is trying to use that information to identify what are the most important reefs right now to stimulate recovery on reefs that have recently been damaged by coral bleaching events uh, or cranthorn starfish outbreaks. And in order to do that, you need a lot of information, but fairly basic information from a large number of reefs. Now there's nearly 4,000 reefs. So that's a big task. And it's certainly beyond the ability of scientists to do it. And so we partnered with um, Citizens of the GBR, which is a citizen science organization based in Cairns and developed a project that piloted last year to encourage people to participate in one of two ways. Either they go out on boats and actually go and take photographs of reefs and that's what uploaded. Or they can join the, the workforce of people interpreting those photographs and saying, well, how much coral is there? Is there? Are there signs of damage? And that first phase of the project, which only lasted two months, has been terrifically successful. You know, we've had um, something like 13,000 um, people survey those reefs, members of the public, looking at these photographs. We've surveyed about 150 reefs. Um, and so that's a really significant contribution. And when we look at our prioritization of those reefs for their importance, adding that information has really changed where we prioritize. So there's all sorts of ways that people can get engaged. Uh, and I think that's, that's it's really uh, fun working with people in that capacity. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was that was so interesting. Yeah, I've heard about the citizens of the Great Barrier Reef project. Um, it's such a great way to get communities and, and people involved, obviously, that, that also love the ocean, but can contribute to um, helping protect it. That's that's awesome. Um, and yeah, next, love to hear from Jennifer, um, who is yeah, studying her PhD with Peter, under Peter, um, and is currently looking at unique methodology for improving climate projections on coral reef environments. Um, so yeah, incredibly relevant and interesting. And Jen, I'd love you to talk more about, about that and your work again, thanks. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna, I prepared some slides for today. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, all right. I think everyone should be able to see that. If someone could just give me a yes, so I can see your slides, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, great. yeah. okay, great. Well, thank you for having me on the panel. I'm Jen McWhorter. I'm a PhD student in Professor Peter Mumby's lab, who you just heard from. I'm split between the University of Exeter in England and the University of Queensland in a program called QUEX. I'm studying futures under climate change and more specifically focusing on improving our climate projections over the Great Barrier Reef under various emission scenarios. A little bit about me, um, I was first inspired to study the ocean at age 10 when visiting Port Douglas with my family and learning about the threat to the GBR from climate change. I then continued a marine science track always involving a lot of data and analysis and technology I've also had the privilege of spending time on Capitol Hill lobbying for various oceanographic programs. 
My passion for being in the water continues to drive my research. I love to surf and to dive. Now I'm going to discuss the focus of my PhD research by providing some background and then showing some key results that I have so far. As many of you know, the Great Barrier Reef has experienced three mass coral bleaching events in the past five years. These events are becoming more frequent and intense as the planet continues to warm. Prolonged warming can lead to the mortality of corals. The focus of my work is to quantify what we can expect into the future on the Great Barrier Reef using the latest climate models and scenarios of our potential warming pathways. To quantify stress to corals, we use well-established trajectories or shared socioeconomic pathways. You can kind of think of this as um, model simulations or how will we expect the planet to be in the future. These pathways allow us to study how much warming we can expect and also how we might need to change to limit warming. SSP1 is the sustainable development path. I've been focusing on the two lowest scenarios to quantify the difference in coral stress as limiting to warming to 1.5 degrees C is the latest global tar target and it was previously two degrees C. And as you know, corals are very sensitive to even slight change in temperature. These low climate scenarios focus on low material growth, lower resources and energy intensity and have strong focus on the global commons, which means investing in education, health and economic growth to emphasize human well-being globally. As a result, inequality is reduced across countries. Alternatively, in the SSP3 picture, oh, it's a world that focuses on regional rivalry. It's a rise in nationalism, a scenario where regional competitiveness and conflict drive countries to focus on their own energy and food security goals. Additionally, investments in education and technology decline, inequalities worsen, and economic development is slow. Population growth in this scenario is high in developing countries and low in industrialized countries. Also, the international community does not prioritize environmental issues in this scenario. And finally, the SSP5 narrative is a world based on fossil fuel development with global average warming reaching approximately five degrees C by 2100. This, this pathway has energy intensive lifestyles which grow the global economy and population. Competitive markets drive technology, innovation and human capital development. Populations peak and then decline and local environmental problems are successfully managed and solutions such as geoengineering may be included to manage social and ecological systems. Geoengineering refers to large scale interventions to alter earth systems and these are often high risk. So now that I have discussed various climate scenarios, you can see them here in our results, which are not published yet. The green trend is referring to the 1.5 trajectory or the lowest scenario, followed by the two degrees C scenario in blue and the regional rival rivalry scenario in orange, and finally the fossil fuel development scenario in red. In the plot on the left, this is measuring coral stress using a metric that allows us to look at the magnitude. Uh, this is also called degree heating weeks or a prolonged intense warming on the Great Barrier Reef. The black line refers to a critical threshold in corals where we often see mortality. As you can see, the lower scenarios remain below this thresh threshold, while the lowest scenario peaks around mid-century and then returns to near present day conditions. In, this, in the green line on the plot on the lowest scenario, this scenario accounts for technology that will extract CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is why, we're, why we are seeing this dramatic reduction in the second half of the century in that scenario. The other low scenario of two degrees is below that threshold, but is still pretty close. Um, the plot on the right shows the number of severe bleaching events per decade, and the lowest scenario has approximately 
two to three events less per decade than the two degree scenario in blue. It is also worth noting that the higher scenarios are about three to four times greater in terms of coral stress, showing as much as annual bleaching in the highest scenario in 2080. The silver lining to this story is along the lines of what Pete mentioned is that we do have a lot of different reefs all over and some will be better off than others. Uh, these trends are showing an average across the entire Great Barrier Reef. And I'm studying these locations further in my thesis and unfortunately I don't have time to discuss them today. Um, all of this may seem a bit overwhelming, but there are, lots, there are lots of things we can do as individuals to reduce our climate footprint. For example, we can reduce our consumption. We can buy used items, buy local food, eat less meat. We can change our methods of travel, like taking your bike, using public transport, driving less, traveling less, maybe taking longer holidays and trips to reduce the frequency of your travel. We can also elect leaders that are committed to climate action. Additionally, educating yourself and others on these topics is very important. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thank you. That was um, that was fascinating. And yeah, you're right. Education is definitely important. So hoping with this event and um, yeah, many others that that we can kind of hit that. Um, I was really liked how you talked about the the kind of tie in nature of increased education, health and diminishing inequality. I think it's so important to remember when we talk about things that reef, like it's not this abstract, beautiful thing that we just go into, like we are a part of nature as well. We're not we're not separate from it as humans. Um, and therefore we we absolutely have the responsibility to um to protect it. So yeah, thank you so much. That was that was really enlightening. Um, no problem. All right, next. Can we hear from Gavin, please? Um, I'll let him introduce himself again and talk about his work. Um, but he's a Uganji man. He's from the region from Cairns to Port Douglas and currently working as a project manager um, with the Dawuru Aboriginal Corporation and um, is also a coordinator for the Land and Sea Ranger Program and um, traditional use of marine resources agreements. So I'll give it, yeah, pass on to Gavin. He can speak more about that. Thanks. No worries. Uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, as part of this uh, seminar. Uh, firstly, on uh, behalf of uh, my people, on behalf of my uh, yeah, people up in Cairns here, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners um, of Mianjin down there. So I'd just like to say, Nyorumba, Nganjan Garan, Bulumba Yurpen, Bul Bukangu, Nganjimoko, Mundugur Janan, and Gokoi. So basically I've said is, um, you know, we've come to talk about a special place here uh, that we that we now call the Great Barrier Reef and that, um, you know, our ancestors uh, are happy that we are having this conversation and that um, you know, I wish everyone in good spirits um, while we are here talking about uh, this issue. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the traditional owner groups of the Great Barrier Reef uh, landscape and its catchments uh, from the Torres Strait all the way down to uh, the Bundaberg region. Um, you know, it just shows how important this system is to, um, to everyone. Um, and it stretches for a large area of country. And um, the 70 or more traditional owner groups with connections to uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you know, I just really want to acknowledge that and all their old people. Um, as we know, uh, the Great Barrier Reef being a cultural land and seascape, um, you know, very, very important. It does have its indigenous Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander heritage values of the reef, which sometimes um, is often forgotten. And, um, and I think, you know, just, just, you know, reflecting back and, and, and acknowledging that, you know, there is generations of, of knowledge and connection and relationship with the Great Barrier Reef, you know, going back uh, generations. And um, for me, for my people, you know, I've, I've 
we we still know we still have been told about stories of you know the the um where uh the original coastline once stood out on the continental shelf and how the reef was formed and in a sense a story about sea level rise happened years ago and forming different places along the coastline you know different coral reefs uh different islands sand caves underwater springs and channels are coming up into the ocean and um, the relationship between those places and things that are happening on land um, you know which is really really important and the reason why i, I start with that because that's really um, you know that really captures the core values of of, um, of, of who we are um, in terms of traditional owners and custodians of, of country you know, when we look at land and sea as being all connected and holistic, um, so we got to look, we got to manage it holistically and and look at the big picture, but also understanding uh, the relationships that are happening at play. You know, within our environment around us, um, some people call it the, the ecosystem and the in the relationships that are happening, but also how people fit into that system and. Um, this is where our ranger program plays a part because our land and sea ranger program, um, there are many across Australia and then in, in the Great Barrier Reef itself, there are many um, ranger groups operating along here. And our particular ranger program, the Urikanji land and sea ranger program operating between Cairns and Port Douglas uh, along the coast. And, um, you know, we're involved in a lot of different activities, but it comes back to our, our core values, um, our traditional knowledge and perspectives and how we see uh, the reef and how we integrate that knowledge with, with contemporary practices, science, technology. How do we use those tools to, to manage, uh, to protect and sustain uh, the Great Barrier Reef? And how do we incorporate that into our, our planning at decision making, you know, to target specific issues that that we are facing, such as uh, climate change and other issues that we are facing as well. Um, so that that's where I see the range of program playing a, a really huge part in in all those different things, and um, it does provide that opportunity for for traditional owners um, in terms of employment, continuing connection to. Uh, the sea country, the Great Barrier Reef, and continuing our culture and who we are, our well-being, which is all, all intertwined, interconnected. And um, not only the Ranger Program is, you know, um, providing those types of benefits, but it's also addressing, you know, priorities, plans at, at the state, national level, whether it be the Reef 2050 plan, whether it be the Great Barrier Reef, uh, you know, blueprint for resilience and plans like that that are, you know, um, and frameworks within the Australian government, Queensland government, or within our regional and, and local areas, uh, but also all the way through to the international levels in terms of the sustainable uh, development goals around, um, you know, SDG 13, 14, 15 in particular. Um, uh, can't isolate the Great Barrier Reef on its own as, as in water. It, it does have all these other goals that are intertwined and, you know, at the local level, you know, um, you know, I believe at the local level, you know, there's a lot of things that apply um, from, from international that go all the way through. And um, with our range of program, we, we are involved in many different projects. Uh, the, the, main, the main key projects I guess I would like to share is our, our coastal bird project that we work on at uh, one of our Ks outside of Cairns, Michaelmas K. Uh, we've been um, uh, providing, uh, you know, doing bird monitoring out there for the last six years and, and understanding uh, the habitat around that K and impacts around, around the K um, with our birds. Um, as we know, those birds are traveling, um, you know, migrating um, outside of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we also involved in a lot of waste and, and marine debris removal activities, also in the creek in the catchment and also along the beaches and out on the Cay. Uh, also involved in 
a bit, bit of a natural area restoration work. So we've done some mangrove replanting work along some of the lower catchments, river catchments flowing out into the sea. Surveillance work, uh, our ranger program and many other ranger groups are getting more involved in compliance by security type work. So we're reporting on different um, issues that are happening out there, whether it be illegal or unsustainable activities on the reef, but also you know, biosecurity concerns such as uh, the black scar oyster that's coming through. Our education is a big part of our program. So engaging with schools, community, promoting, um, you know, the, not just the indigenous perspectives of the reef, but also all the positive work that we are doing, all the partnerships that we have and trying to address all these different issues, whether it's through wildlife monitoring of marine turtles, dugongs, sharks um, and we're involved in all that type of work out of Cairns um, and one I guess one project that we've started a pilot project is called the Kulbul uh, project uh, we're working in uh, collaboration with Experience Co uh, one of the reef tourism operators reef restoration foundation also working with citizens of the Great Bay Reef uh, James Cook University as well and through this project, we've identified three different reef sites. Um, and what, what we're trying to do is trying to learn and understand what's happening on that reef, what threats are happening, also understanding the, um, what, what's there in terms of the coral fragments of opportunity, the coral spawning activity. And then we start looking at um, the indigenous knowledge of, of those sites. But then we, we start to put together um, you know, a toolbox and the decision tree framework. And so how we, you know, identifying, you know, what interventions may be deployed or whether there needs to be any interventions uh, um, required at all. Um, as we know, all reefs are important, but, you know, within this project, we've chosen three um, key reef sites that we wish to um, manage through that project. Yep. Thanks so much, Gavin. Yeah, um, that Kubul project sounds really interesting. I love the idea of kind of building a toolbox to to address these things and looking at three specific sites to to learn more about it and hopefully apply that integrated approach and knowledge to um, yeah other areas and other reefs. That's yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and if we could, yeah, now hear from Holton, our last speaker for today. Um, he's working for the Great Barrier Reef um, Foundation as a oh sorry no the reef and rainforest research center um as a program executive so uh yeah halton if you could talk to us about that that'd be great thanks olivia uh and yes hi everyone i work for the reef and rainforest research center up here in Cairns on uh, gavin's country the uganji country um or as some of you may know here palm cove um, just north of Cairns. So um, I'd like to just uh, quickly summarize some of the stuff that RRRC has been doing uh, that links in with some of the things that you've already heard uh, today. So um, RRRC has worked with uh, Pete Mumby underneath the National Environmental Science Program's Tropical Water Quality Hub, uh, which is a, uh, a, a bucket of funding that was uh, allocated towards water quality research and improvement along the Queensland coast to address some of the issues with the reef uh, in terms of water quality. And uh, one of the projects from that, a, uh, from that hub was the Project 25 project, which looked at how cane farmers were using nutrients on their farms and how it would be affecting the, the reef and the reef lagoon. Um, and this took place in the Mulgrave Russell River catchment just south of Cairns, which is a very uh, reliable catchment. It's very, um, very reliable in that it gets a very consistent wet season each year and lots of water runs through it. Um, and all of the farmers there are, are quite old, second generation farmers working their land. And uh, some of them aren't really aware of the impact that nutrients or sediment has on their, uh, from, on, on the reef. So what Project 25 looked at doing was um, taking a different approach. And rather than chastising farmers and telling them that this is what's happening on your farm and this is how nutrients are affecting the reef and, and, and you need to do better, uh, it gave them the, the, the driver's seat and said, we're going to censor up the catchment and you're going to be able to see the data and share it and have these meetings with uh, fellow 
fellow farmers, growers, and talk about what you have, uh, what you've what you've seen, and how you can improve your practices. And it was really, really successful. We had uh, growers leading the conversations in these shed meetings, and uh, they'd pull up their little uh, app, which shows where all the the nutrient spikes were in the catchment, and they said. Um, okay, so we got a big spike here on this date coming down from this creek. Does anyone know what happens there? And, you know, Skinny Bevan up the back puts up his hand and he says, yeah, that was me, sorry. And, and that was a really uh, breakthrough moment for them, I think, because it, it showed that they were starting to engage with the science, the data, and uh, trust in the framework and trust in, the, in, the, in, in what they're seeing. And, and, and we're finding that that's going to be really the, the key thing for a lot of this reef work is that um, it's a people problem just as much as it is a pollution problem, whether you're talking about sediments or, or nutrients, um, in that the people need to be the ones enacting the change. And so um, I would certainly uh, implore you all to look into the Citizens of the Great Bay Reef Census project that Pete was mentioning. I would implore you all to look into uh, the work that uh, Gavin's, Gavin's organization does with their land and sea ranges as well. And, and support some of that on-ground research uh, action. Because um, as we know, climate change is a real threat and it's not going to be able to be abated um, in, a, in a short period of time. So while we can expect there to be significant impacts on the reef in the future, we can still do our very best to, uh, as Pete was talking about, protect the refugia that's valuable and reseeding other areas potentially. Uh, we can look at crown of thorn starfish control and managing the crown of thorns outbreaks. Uh, to protect those key reefs that, that Pete mentioned. And, um, and we can also support better land and sea use through the traditional owners, uh, the Tamra traditional use um, marine agreements that, that are set up along the, the coastline so that there is a, a more holistic approach to the sharing of knowledge and better stewardship um, between people, researchers and traditional owners um, in those areas. So um, yeah, if you are in a, in a major metropolitan area and you're feeling like you can't really do much, uh, for for the reef uh, in your big uh, big city, then don't worry because you can always access these citizen science projects. And I know that Mangrove Watch is another one that may not have been mentioned. Um, it could be operating in Brisbane if you're from Brisbane area because the uh, Mangrove Watch uh, is something that is a citizen science uh, project that is accessible to anyone in the public. They can sign on and uh, learn about monitoring mangrove ecosystems and protecting those for future generations to come. So um, I think I'll just uh, leave it at that um, and push pass back on to you guys for the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Colton. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, I know that the um, crown of thorn starfish is a huge problem on the reef at the moment. So yeah, and great with the call to action about the citizen science projects. That is super exciting for anyone that's here or listening to this recording at home. Um, yeah, that's really great that other people can get involved. Um, so I've had a few questions come through. If um, all of our speakers want to jump back on so we can get into the Q&A and for anyone that joined a bit later, if you just want to um, pop any questions that you have in the Q&A box, we can um, hopefully get around to a few of those as well. Um, there was one from Anonymous, but talking about successful reef management policies. I know, Peter, at the beginning, you listed a few um, particularly in Belize that you found really positive success stories there. Um, would anyone be interested in sharing an Australian one as well? So something to yeah, potentially model, model future policy or decision making on um, that was a successful, yeah, some sort of successful regenerative uh, story for the reef? I, I would. I would say certainly say that one of the success stories is the rezoning of the reef that took place in 2004, when the reef, the amount of area that was fully protected from harvesting went from less than 10%, if our memory serves, to over 30%. And, you know, that's really in line with best practice that the sort of overwhelming science argues that there's a lot of benefits, biodiversity and fisheries benefits that follow from having 30% no-take areas, which, which we have on the Barrier Reef. And you know, increasingly, there are more and more studies discovering benefits associated with those closed areas. So for me, that's certainly one of them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, if we could grow that figure even more, do you think that's something 
that we could quite easily do? Do you think like, what do you think the main blockages would be around that? Why, why well, hasn't it progressed even further, do you think? Well, it's interesting because I, you know, I actually think that the science argues that 30% is good, um, very good in fact, but you can actually have a negative effect if you protect too much of it because um, you, although that would be great for biodiversity, it would eventually have negative effects on, on fishing if you close so much of it that people now um, have got relatively poor access to fishing grounds. And, and 30% seems to be a sort of sweet spot where you'll usually get a net benefit and you almost always get a net benefit to fisheries because of fish spilling out of those protected areas um, without having a negative effect on people's livelihoods. So it's a net benefit. So, um, you know, I think, I think where the, a lot of the innovation in management will probably move towards is not relying more on closing areas, but sort of targeting interventions, maybe just for short periods of time where they're most useful. Because um, I think that the, 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 long, the real value of having a long term set of closed areas is that because they last for so long, that the fish get to grow, you know, to a great old age, and therefore you really do build up that biomass of big fish that has all these benefits. So you don't want to mess with that, um, but you might want to supplement things here and there. So I think that's probably where the biggest uh, change will be. Yeah, okay, that is really interesting. Um, that kind of leads onto a question I was hoping to put to yeah, you, Peter, or anyone else on the panel um, about fishing. So in terms of companies attempting to promote sort of ethical, ethical fishing and ethical tourism, what do you think... Yeah, what do you think is a, a valid approach to that? Is there a valid approach to that? Or, um, yeah, just love to hear everyone on the panel's thoughts on that one, actually. I think it's quite topical at the moment, obviously, with um, a new documentary out on Netflix. I'm sure some people here might have seen Seaspiracy. Um, but, yeah, if, if I'd love to hear everyone's opinions on that. Anyone like to go first from the panel? Oh, Peter? Oh. Halton, looks like Halton, you've... Uh, I'm thinking that. about it, Peter. I'm not a fisheries expert um, <laughs> on the outset here. And a lot of our research at RCCC doesn't focus around that, but we did have some discussions at a recent forum um, at our Crown of Thorns Starfish Control Forum, uh, talking about the impact of fisheries on uh, species at certain reefs. And I would tend to agree with Peter that um, an adaptive management approach would take that shift in ecosystem um, stability or health into, into account. Um, the reef is an incredibly large ecosystem and uh, the fisheries framework that we have is probably more, um, it would be a, more question, a question more for the commercial fisheries rather than recreational fisheries. So as a, as a recreational fisher, I don't think that there would be a significant impact on the Great Barrier Reef based on how people fish recreationally, but um, it would be probably a different question for some of the more commercial operators. Yeah, I, I agree. It's interesting. We don't actually know very much about some of the negative effects that fishing may have. We've got these intriguing insights from some studies that have shown um, from the AIMS data, for example, this is the people who do the monitoring of the reef, that, that corals overall on average seem to do better in these protected areas. And it's really hard to figure out exactly why. Um, in much of the world, it's you know you can trace it to really obvious effects of fishing where you've just taken too many herbivores or there's a lot of anchor damage or blast fishing and so on. It's not so clear what the mechanism is here. It could be, and we know that there is physical damage to the reef with a number of different fishing methods that people use. Um, people either drag anchors or they drag weights on the bottom and that has direct impacts. We don't know enough about how big those impacts are in general. Um, uh so that's an issue and then of course as, as um Holton's alluding to that there's a potential link between fishing and there being more crown of thorns starfish and again this is probably a complex ecological story where some of the fish that are being harvested and those are usually the more sort of top at level predators the snappers the groupers are preying on something that preys on something that has an effect on crown of thorn starfish when they're this big 
you know, and we don't understand that pathway yet, but there seems to be some evidence that there's um, some impact of fishing that helps crown of thorns. Um, but in terms of uh, ethical fishing, to me, you know, it, it's there's two elements to it. One is we really need to be pretty confident that there's more work to do to figure out how much damage reef fishing of all sorts occur, does to reefs and where what sorts of corals are most vulnerable to it, how big a problem is it, and then what could be done to try and reduce those impacts. And you know, in general, um, there's good relationships between fishers trying to find solutions to some impacts. Just like all these things, no one actually wants to have a negative effect, um, but sometimes that they are and they don't realize it. Um, and the other thing is, is, of course, harvesting. How much do you harvest? And trying to create sustainable harvesting. And that's a real problem because at this point, the amount of reporting of fishing in Queensland is poor. Uh, Australia does not lead the world. Certainly Queensland does not lead the world in the quality of its fisheries reporting. Um, and, and so we, you know, that, that's changed in, it's gotten worse in the last sort of number of years. So we don't have a good imp idea of exactly uh, whether some fisheries are being over harvested. And so I think there's a lot to do to demonstrate whether or not certain fisheries are sustainable or not. And that does involve, you know, better fisheries management. And it's a difficult thing because for so long we've we've had sort of norms that, that are fairly free and fairly loose. Um, it's not an easy job, job to tighten it up, but um, I think that does need more scrutiny. Okay, Gavin and Jen, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I could. Uh, the only, I guess, thoughts I had on the um, topic was um, when the, the marine park zoning occurred, um, it did not um, incorporate traditional owner perspective on, on where areas could be green zone, where areas, um, you know. So when we, when we start looking at areas along the coast, traditionally there were areas where fishing did not happen. Um, but, you know, and then there were areas that were traditionally fished. Um, and so, you know, we we're seeing some of our very um, cultural places that, you know, are zone blue. And, you know, we got fishing activity happening right there. Um, you know, we've got sites, cultural heritage sites, really old sites and areas where fishing is allowed to happen and it's impacting on those things. Um, there's also places where, uh, you know, under um, our knowledge where different animals and, and um, uh, are breeding, you know, dugong, um, turtles, and they are now just blue zones and fishing is allowed to happen. So, you know, in terms of ethics, when we, when we start thinking about the, the permissions around fishing activities happening, um, you know, it, it doesn't take into account the cultural perspective or the values. What what the government sees as a low risk is complete could be completely different on how traditional owners would see a risk, high high mid low risk. And um, we're already having that conversation in the marine park around tourism activities, around research happening on the reef, and you know what what the government sees as a low risk or low impact. Sorry, low impact activity yeah it could be a mid or high act, um, impact activity to us so um you know th that's that's one thing um and yeah in terms of ethics and having that that tick of approval from everyone from from the science um that that supports that um, activity allowed to happen uh, the tick from you know the social or cultural perspective but then you also the tick then around um, its impact yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, and Jen, did you have any thoughts on this one as well in, in your research? Well, I, uh, I, I think I can speak more from, from someone that tries to make ethical choices about um, seafood and consumption. And um, from, from that perspective, knowing where you buy your fish from, where it's coming from, um, what you're consuming, those choices are, are really important. And generally speaking, if you're, 
if you're buying local, you have a, a better chance of buying something that's more sustainable than it coming from overseas, right? So that's having a larger carbon footprint coming in. Um, also, certain things um, that I look for, um, you know, making sustainable seafood choices are maybe having things that are um, that actually do a service to the ecosystem like shellfish can filter water and um, help water quality and things like that. So um, while there is a lot of controversy along fisheries and, um, and whatnot um, from that documentary, especially, and a lot of people are talking about it, um, just kind of becoming a little bit more informed on um, on, on good choices as well is, is something that um, I think that piece was lacking um, regarding the Great Barrier Reef and management of fisheries. Um, well, that's something I really haven't dove a lot into. And, um, and yeah, I, I, um, I would agree that cultural um, practices and traditions are important when it comes to zoning. And I'm glad that some of those conversations are starting to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> the reef being sustained um, by Indigenous owners and land and sea owners for so much longer than, you know, the fisheries department have been around. Um, and this is something every one of you have sort of touched on before, um, but I did just want to ask if there was something else to add to this, because I think we do want to focus on what we can all do as both individuals and communities. I mean, I love the idea of the, the citizen involvement on the reef. Um, yeah, if everyone could just say I guess one key or several if you like most effective thing that individuals and communities can do um, to yeah to stop such aggressive effects of, of climate change on the reef and to um, really make sure that we don't get into those red levels on your on your graphs Jen. So yeah this is open to everyone on the panel whoever wants to go first. Well, um, I can I can kick it off. I, you know, I think one of the most important things we can do is excite people. You know, get people in the water, show them how beautiful this place is, and build connection and emotion towards towards the places that we love and respect. And um, I think starting there, and you know, giving people a reason to care and and showing them how much respect this, these places deserve is the first step in then talking about, you know, like we, all, we need to reduce our emissions and there's lots of things we can do individually to be stewards of that and take care of this planet together, you know, and not, not as, um, you know, I spoke about that regional rivalries, you know, we don't want to be butting heads with capitalistic goals. We want to embrace our planet this is all of our planet and uh, take care of it so, thanks thanks jen and um, i concur with you there and add that um yeah if you if you feel like you have a special skill in your particular profession or if you're just particularly motivated to do something i noticed someone in the in the q a uh, put a question to us to say oh do you think it would be good to have more aware awareness what do you think of films not documentaries exploring the issue like penguin bloom dry the sapphires as an example and um that's a that's an idea that they came up with which which would, could potentially be a really good one and it's and it's their skill set at work there so um like jen said being stewards um and sharing the the messaging around the science and around the importance of protecting the reef uh, will garner the policy outcomes in the long run and uh, yeah, voting with your dollar, reducing your consumption and uh, supporting good policy for renewable energies, marine park conservation. Um, and you can even switch your super to a green fund or something like that if you want to send an extra message. I think that, um, that getting the word out that people are doing things and that there are things that, that can be done both locally and globally is so important. And you know, there's this fabulous word of cognitive dissonance that I learned about and there's a great story about climate change from Norway where for a few years that the the winter um, winter sports industry failed because it was just exceptionally warm winters and you think in a country like Norway where people aren't climate change denialists there's a very high level of awareness about these sorts of problems um, 
that people would take some sort of action. It would, it, it would motivate people to say, look, we're already experiencing these effects. We need to do something. But it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't primarily was that a lot of people didn't couldn't see what could be done. They didn't know there was an answer, a solution. And what people do when they when they're faced with that is that they just don't think about it. Think about something else. And, and I think there's a real risk that people have already written off the Great Barrier Reef that you hear people say, isn't that reef dead? Because that's what the media, that's the story that you keep hearing. And of course it isn't. And one of the great things about going out there for yourself or, or watching the documentaries or participating and talking about it, telling people is you're, you're getting the word out that you, you shouldn't, you don't need to switch off and forget about it. it, it you can engage with it. That's all. Yeah, I think um, just to add to add to it, I think um, yeah, action um, and everyone everyone can play a role. Um, everyone can can do something. Um, it starts with the individual. Um, and we all all need to work together. Um, need to support all the work that's there because there is a lot of positive work happening. You know, so so very often we hear all the negative stories and um, you know. There, are, there is a lot of positive work happen, happening uh, locally, regionally, and um, yeah, partnerships have been a big part of our, of our program. Um, you know, working with all the different um, agencies that are out there, uh, Great Barrier Reef, Marine Park Authority, Great Barrier Reef Foundation, there's, you know, others there too, so Triple RC. There's many out there who are doing a lot of positive things. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I see that as a really key part of, of working together collaboration. Um, it's hard to do it alone, uh, but together, especially when we're facing things like climate change and, and issues that are much bigger than, than one, you know, we all need to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're all really amazing answers and definitely inspiring. And, and it's good to get that positive message and appreciate, you know, appreciate the ocean, get amongst nature and realise that yeah, this is this is all something we can work towards, um, even if it does feel like an enormous insurmountable issue. Um, there was one question from the question A box as well, um, off the back of that, talking about the Australian government particularly responsibility there to address the effects of climate change on the reef. Um, what what do you think, for anyone from the panel? Yeah, what, what do you think the responsibility is there and what kind of action would you like to see the government do and, and sort of how can we put pressure on that or how can we, yeah, encourage that kind of action? Well, I'll just quickly kick off and say, uh, sorry, Pete, I'll just quickly say that um, the Queensland government, as John mentioned before, has started this transition towards a, a greener energy uh, policy with the, the Gladstone uh, hydrogen hub. And I think that a, a quicker shift to a, a totally renewable uh, energy mix for the grid, um, for Queensland as well as Australia, is, is one of the biggest things we can do. Australia has this almost heritage in its identity based around the resource sector and that because we have built our wealth and prosperity on the resources beneath the soil that that's our entitled uh, traditional heritage that we ought to continue but um, there's nothing stopping us from transitioning um, given what's at risk and um, so I think that's the major one in my in my view but also there are other things that can be done in terms of actual large-scale restoration projects uh, for the reef whether it be on the water uh, with development of artificial reef structures um, or gully remediation for large catchments that are, uh, are seeing enormous amounts of sediment going into the reef lagoons, those sediments that people were mentioning before, uh, detrimental to the reef ecosystem. And so there are actual feasibility studies that have been done that have uh, put a price on what it would cost to uh, remediate those huge gullies and those catchments and, and stem the flow of those sediments and topsoil into the reef. And they're not cheap. They are in the order of 180 to $200 million per catchment, which is um, you know, significant, but that is also equatable to say a large interchange um, overpass or you know, civic uh, infrastructure project on land anyway. So within the scheme of the budget, it can be put into the mix if it's been given enough impetus. So I'll, I'll descend on that.
just wait. I was just trying to break up the order of people. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people were disappointed with the budget. I think it's a great point that you've made, Halton, that the Queensland government and the federal government are two very different beasts when it comes to climate change. And um, one's a beast, one isn't, I guess. And, you know, it's it's really disappointing to see the lack of investment in renewables and um and and i guess you know we all have to our role as citizens to pressurize government to get their act together and um it's uh you know not much more to say about it than that really there's a lot more that 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 can be done and needs to be done um and you know and i guess one other point which i guess it's a bit like what I started with is there are people that argue that we shouldn't be spending large amounts of money um, trying to manage the reef better. We should be putting all of our resources into climate change. And I totally disagree with that because, as I said, we need to have action on climate change and improve the way we manage. Reefs. Whatever happens, reefs are going to experience more stress, even on the most ambitious of our future pathways. And so we have to manage them even better than we do now in order to sustain them into the future, even under a very uh, good climate outcome. So we need to invest in both of these things. And as Halston just pointed out, although these are big sounding costs, when you compare them to other sorts of infrastructure pro uh, projects, they're, you know, tiny. And, um, you know, so if, as, as a voting public, if it was sufficiently important to the public that we maybe do one less bridge and solve one more catchment, that would probably be a better outcome. Yeah, I can, um, just some thoughts around, um, you know, well, the Australian government has put investment in different projects, um, whether it be um, in a fire in terms of restoring uh, you know, traditional knowledge around fire management practices. Like we know that there's some investment there, even on the reef, but it's more so what can the government do to mitigate impact? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, allowing developments to happen, um, tree clearing to continue to happen. Um, you know, cause one of the, um, I guess one of the, the main um, management actions towards climate change is restoring our natural environment, especially, you know, with the Great Barrier Reef, you know, it, it's, it's our first barrier. Um, and then once we lose, if we ever lost that barrier, what's our next barrier is our mangroves. Um, but a lot of our mangroves are getting, you know, sliced up. Um, so, you know, the, 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 their systems are getting weakened uh, on the land and other systems that support the reef, um, you know, fish habitat areas and things like that. Um, and our, our, um, our springs are coming out on the reef if they, you know, getting get to develop or get impacted in some way or form. So, yeah, I think it's one putting investment into climate change, but at the same time, you know, what can the government do to uh, reduce impact um, to the reef is another thing. Um, yeah, all great responses. Um, I, I would I would just like to iterate that Australia is a land of extremes, and Australia should be a leader in tackling climate change. And I I would like to see Australia leading the way in terms of renewables and land management and and whatnot and having such a special resource such as the Great Barrier Reef, you know, um, yeah, it, it would just, it, it would it would really set the precedent, I think, if, if Australia would take some action. And I, I just um, wanted to revisit one point in that, I, and that's really brought on from Gavin's comments that it is fair, to, to be fair, the, federal government has made investments into water quality management for, for quite a long time. Um, uh, it's also fair to say that they have made some significant investments in how you might want to manage the reef better. And so that's positive. And 
you know, we just hope that the resources to manage the reefs will, will continue to be made available in the future. Um, one of the problems I think is it's quite hard at this point to argue how much, if you were to say, what is the cost of actually saving the reef? No one can really give you a clear answer on that one. Um, and, and so asking for more and more funding when you can't really guarantee what that would buy you is sort of tricky. But I think we're moving closer and closer to a point where you, know, you really can put a price on what kind of future you want. And that makes it an, an easier conversation. It doesn't mean it's any easier to get the, the right support from everybody to get the funding that's required, but at least it makes it a, a more transparent problem to people to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and also, I'd like to look at a bit more of an international perspective as well on this. I know, Gavin, you presented at the UN Climate Change Conference um, and attended the UN Ocean Conference a few years back. Um, so this is to, to Gavin, but also to everyone about the international community. Obviously, we've got, we've got the UN and we've got international bodies that are uh, wanting to protect our reef and oceans. Um, I, what do you guys see as the international responsibility there? And do you think it's an international collective responsibility? And, and how, can, how can these bodies help or do we need to sort of entrench these values and attitudes in our, in our own obviously day-to-day -day lives and our government, which we've talked about? Um, but yeah, and, and if there are any interesting projects that you've, you've kind of done, obviously, Petty spoke about that before, but international um, yeah, models as well that you think Australia could adopt. So it's quite a big question, but yeah, have a crack. I'm going to let Gavin go first on this one. Still trying to find an answer. I'll, I will think about it for a bit more. Yeah, sorry, that was incredibly long and maybe a bit complicated. But um... there's, there's a lot of really positive things happening globally, and and certainly one thing I've been uh, only tangentially involved in, but it's been great to witness is when people start applying behaviour change programs where they you know, they take quite a lot of history of understanding the psychology of what it, what changes people's behavior. And then working with communities, and there was a project I was involved with in parts of rural Indonesia in Sulawesi, um, where, you know, like we're all familiar with the plastics problem in the oceans. And, and this was a great team of people working with the village there about the plastic problem. And first of all, you know, having this conversation to help people come to their own conclusions about whether there's a problem, what the causes of the problem are, and what they think the solutions are. And it's a simple process, but it is based on actually some psychology theory. And it's remarkable to see the outcome. So people um, changing little things like they would be buying bigger bottles of water. Um, there'll be, um, there's actually a uh, one person developed managed to develop a, a business in connecting recycling to other areas and the village became so clean that it got nominated for this sort of tidy town award in Indonesia then it got bigger and bigger and so that was fascinating because it created this curiosity in other parts of the country like what's going on over here what are they doing which helps to spread the word and, and scale things and you know it starts very simply but those things really can um, spread with the right kind of innovation, I guess. And I, so I think that's a, a great example that could be brought to a whole range of problems. So go psychologists. Yeah, that's great. Oh, sorry, Jen, I was going to say, Gavin, if you wanted to talk about your time at, um, with the UN roles, but also Jen, if you wanted to answer that, jump in, absolutely. Um, I, I just wanted to say one of the uh, topics that I spoke about was inequality and a project that I had witnessed um, when I was in Belize actually was women were getting um, the lionfish from fishermen, which are an invasive species that um, actually eat a lot of the juvenile reef fish and can um, 
to great wreaths. So the lionfish were being caught and um, these women were making jewelry and things out of the fins and whatnot. And um, therefore it was providing an economic revenue and a solution to the invasive species problem. And they were selling these, um, these jewelry and decorations and, and things to provide some income into their families. And so it was nice to kind of see tackling the invasive species problem with you know, providing some sort of um, means of, of income for the women in Belize. So um, that's one example of a very small, small scale, but conceptually, you know, like let's, let's think about some of the problems and how to, how to tackle them and also give people jobs and whatnot. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, in terms of um, you know, within the Great Barrier space around, um, you know, two examples, I guess, is um, but what we've been involved in um, is around um, with the reef restoration type work. Um, as we know, it's quite new in the reef, uh, the Great Barrier reef space, but it's been practiced, you know, elsewhere across the, across the world. And, um, you know, so, you know, learning from other countries, uh, learning from other, um, so one example was two of our rangers went over to Indonesia um, a couple of years ago and um, yeah, uh, done some training with the Mars Foundation around um, uh, the, the Mars um, star method of, of restoring, you know, parts of the reef or enhancing coral resilience. And, um, you know, so we pilot that method in, on the reef um, a couple of years now. Um, and it's great being a part of, of that learning, um, understanding, you know, when, you know, modifying that method so it suits our environment here, um, something that's more sustainable um, and more eco-friendly and, you know, more, more intact. So, you know, it was good to learn some of that as well, but also, um, you know, we've, we've been also involved with some of the biosecurity type uh, in, in the marine space. So we've had the opportunity to learn from um, New Zealand um, and with some of the, the groups from uh, Hawaii and uh, uh, Canada as well around, you know, issues that, that they're facing in, in their areas around, you know, biosecurity pests and um, being very different areas, the New Zealand area, Hawaii, and, you know, where they're, they're, some of them are being invaded by mangroves and, and mud crab, which is quite um, yeah, interesting for us when, you know, most of our country is mangroves and we've got a lot of mud crab. So, um, you know, to hear that they are pests in their country, um, you know, so, you know, we learn, learn from them, they learn from us, um, part of that exchange and, and knowledge sharing and, um, you know, learning, learn, and, and we sort of know, um, we know that the Great Bay Reef is a World Heritage Area, it's, it's important to everyone across the globe. Um, and so, you know, the international community can play a part in, in terms of, you know, the messaging around how important it is where the government needs to engage with, with local community, um, need to invest in, in local community projects on the ground, whether it be traditional owners, whether it be science research projects, tourism projects, you know, the list goes on, but you know, supporting these projects on the ground and, and collaborations to address different issues or, or knowledge gaps that we're trying to, you know, um, learn about and, and um, hopefully you know, come up with some tools and, and, and ways of moving forward um, on the reef. Yeah, absolutely. I love that idea, that knowledge sharing internationally, especially with Indigenous peoples. I think that's just amazing and hopefully, um, yeah, introduces more innovative ways of protecting the reef and our oceans more generally because it's all it's all connected, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I was just hoping for the last, last question, um, if everyone on the panel could kind of live leave the the participants and attendees with one final thought or, or key takeaway you want everyone to kind of go home with um and also there was a question before about the panelists favorite fish or coral so if you could do both of those things one final thought for everyone and your favorite fish or coral um yeah if everyone could answer that and then we can uh yeah wrap up after that thanks olivia i'll just quickly do my final thought and uh and that's sort of in line with what pete said before and that's that the messaging around the reef is really important and the psychology around the reef is really important and i think what we saw in 2016 was 
a lot of doom and gloom after that bleaching event that really put the problem in the too hard basket for a lot of people, both domestically and internationally. And so it's important to have clear messaging about what the achievable goals are in regards to protection and restoration and how it can be applied and people can get behind it rather than you know, reinforcing the idea that it's, it's not savable, that it, there's nothing that can be done or it's all dead. So my favorite uh, fish uh, on the reef would be uh, probably the hammerhead shark. And my favorite coral would be um, just massive, massive plate coral spreading out for meters and meters, creating like a really cool uh, ceiling for creatures underneath to hang out. Okay, um, so I, I think I want people to bear in mind, no, no pressure, but you know, this is all on our watch. What we do in the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's gonna make all the difference. And so we can't just keep passing the buck to everybody else. It's not just the government's problem. We've all got to do our bit. And um, we all know that but sometimes, I certainly find I have to remind myself that, you know, we got to do it with people who have to do it, not, not others. Um, best fish. Well, I mean, for me, every time I see a bump head parrotfish, I get excited. You know, they're so big. They're like sort of herds of elephant across a reef. It's sort of the equivalent, you know. And, and one of the great things about the Great Barrier Reef is that they're not hunted and almost everywhere else in the world they're hunted really severely so as soon as they see you they take off but here you can almost pet them um you know you can go right up to them and they'll just sort of look ugly at you and they show their green teeth and it's all furry with algal turf growing on it and um you got to love that so that's mine um yeah, my uh, my favorite uh, fish would be a, a grouper. I just like how they fit in the smallest crevices somehow. <laughs> and um, my favorite coral would probably be galaxia, just because of the way the brilliant polyps look like stars. Um, and my message to everyone would be, you know, being a educate yourself and others and be a steward of of climate action you know we all have a lot of work to do together this is our planet and um we could all take a role in being excited about nature and protecting it so that's my main takeaway thanks yep so uh i guess my favorite i don't know my favorite but i think the fish that i'll probably go with is in my language Jagara, um, which is the sawfish and um, coral. Um, I'll, I'll just go with the boulder coral, um, just in terms of the um, you know the rings in inside the the boulder shows how old it is. Um, but uh, I think last final thought for me would just be that um, you know we need the reef; it, it, it provides everything that we need. Um, but also, most importantly, the reef needs us. Uh, you know, the reef is always communicating with us. It's trying to tell us different things, whether it's happy, it's healthy, or when it's sad, when it's unhealthy. And, um, you know, we've got a responsibility to look after and save our reef. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, um, yeah, that was beautiful. And I loved learning about all your favorite fish too. That was an unexpected and fun um, yeah, thing I learned about you guys too today. Um, yeah, thank you so, so much for the, for the speakers, the panelists. That was such a stimulating and interesting discussion. I think I've definitely got some things I've learned and I want to be more motivated to, yeah, to be a more active citizen in protecting our reef. And I hope a lot of our participants feel the same way looking at the comments coming through. I think that's the way as well. Um, I'll just hand over to Joel now to say a final farewell and um, where to find, I think the recording of this and things like that. But yeah, just personally want to say thank you so much to all the panelists and participants for making this, yeah, such an interesting discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Olivia, and a massive thanks again to our panel. Um, I was going to try and write something to wrap up 
quite smart. But then Gavin said something better than I could ever write, which is that, you know, we need the reef. And if after tonight you're still worried about or looking for inspiration about why we should do this thing, just imagine Queensland with no Great Barrier Reef. I, you know, it's quite hard to do, it makes me quite sad to do. Um, but so we have to do because, you know, that's the future, unfortunately, if we don't get our act together, as our excellent panels have talked about. So again, once again, massive thanks to all of our panelists for giving up your time. It's been awesome. Uh, to all our attendees, thanks for coming along. It's been great to have you. The questions were fantastic. Um, make sure you hit up all of our speakers, um, obviously in your own time and maybe in the daytime, about getting involved with their work, finding out more about what they do and supporting the important work that you know all of everyone is doing. Because as I hope we really highlighted tonight, there's a lot of work going on and you should get involved if you are interested because we all should be. And there's some great, you know, roles that we can all can play. Um, I'd like to really thank the people who uh, helped share our event, our good friends at Griffith and UQ, um, and this International and Griffith International Relations Society, the OWF as well, and as well as our lifelong friends at UNAA Queensland and UN Youth. Thank you all for sharing and thank you for being here tonight. It's great to have, you know, the whole family come together for the reef. Um, on that, there's so much more to come this year from this event series. Uh, July is our next event in this national event series, and the Western Australian team is really delving into the murky world of sustainable business, and you know whether that's a real thing, how to do it, how not to do it, and really like that important lesson of what is sustainable business, and that's followed up by the Victorian team hosting something equally as um, murky as sustainable fashion, and how these individuals can really affect uh, sustainable changes through fashion. So we've got a massive year coming up. Um, get involved. There's a UN uh, YP team in most states and territories. There's a national group if you happen to be in NT and there's not a YP team there. Get involved with us, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're across all of it because we do a lot of these events and really try and focus uh, and use our branding and the UN logo to really drive focus towards these important issues like the Great Barrier Reef. So we hope we've done that tonight. Thank you so much again to the panelists. Thank you to the attendees. The video recording will be online. And we'll send an email out in about a week's time with the links to that. No spam, I promise. Just some follow-up links about how you can get involved with the different groups represented here tonight. So excellent. I hope you've had a great time. I've had a great time. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks to the organizing team. And thanks to our speakers. And have a lovely night, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.